All right, man. So what do you think of the friction lab stuff? I thought it was hilarious. You did? Like some of the most absurd video work I've ever seen in a good way. Yeah. It, uh, the fact that people were like, yeah, so is this like running? Is this, this is a joke, right? <laughs> do this actually it's not <laughs> like I actually got paid a small amount of money to, hey, man, to do that. All right. So any, any things you didn't like, any things that stuck out? What no, I mean, look, it's assuming that that's what your client asked for. I think you did a good job, right? <laughs> it's, uh, that was, I, it's, I'm, I love, humor as a vehicle for marketing and so obviously I, I thought it was great and hopefully like you can imagine some, somebody seeing that and actually now being interested in the product because like I would be because I love companies and products that don't take themselves seriously okay you know? so I think to that ex to that extent I I could see it being successful I think it's really hard to know though like you really need to know more about their their goals as a company and what they're trying to get out of the marketing campaign other than obviously everybody wants to sell products, but at the same time, like were there discussions that you had with them around like, you know, brand marketing and, you know, things that don't necessarily directly relate to a conversion. Yeah, absolutely. So the entire like point of it um, is to, you know, start with, because the, the, you know, it's a climbing chalk company and the goal was to introduce them to new markets. I mean, like climbing, there's that video and there's that campaign, but that's kind of easy. They, they're already like have tons of fans and like a hundred K followers, but it's all climbing people. So I'm like trying to help them become more of a fitness brand. And so yeah. the entire, the entire thing was like, okay, well it's, it's COVID. Part of the thing is like, it's COVID. So I had to build a green screen behind me and like shoot it in my apartment and like do everything myself without uh, anybody being able to come in. So Part of it was restricted to that, but uh, the main point is just, you know, to try and make it feel like an internet thing. It doesn't align with their brand. It's like, doesn't make, you know, sense from a visual standpoint for their brand besides like the logo. But um, I think that's okay. Like, I don't think it needs to be, you know, I, I, think it, I think it's just like an extension of their brand. It's just an execution. Did they share that stuff on their platforms? Yeah, people people love it. We're actually running uh, like one of my next questions was about uh, you know so we're we're running it. It's doing well. It it didn't lead to any conversions on YouTube, and so I guess that wasn't the right platform for it. I don't know if I don't know why, but uh, it's doing really well on Facebook and Instagram. We're scaling it um, as we speak, and then uh, we're looking to see if there's other markets that would benefit from a hygienic chalk. Sure. So we're starting to test and stuff like that. But the entire yeah, point I mean, of it. The thing is like with something like YouTube, it's really hard. Something like that isn't just going to work in a vacuum, right? Like you kind of need, whether it's your channel or their channel, there needs to be some sort of, you know, previous history of the brand sort of doing tongue in cheek or humorous videos and things like that. Because otherwise, either if you're kind of starting from zero, it's very hard to get anybody to see it and for it to sort of like take hold. You have to sort of start with a base of people that are, that are in that platform. And, it, and if, that, if like that company, if all they're doing is sharing more straightforward stuff and then you sort of stick a more like, you know, silly, humorous video in the mix, it's just, if that's not what people come to that YouTube channel for on a, on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, it's not gonna, it's not gonna just suddenly connect, right? So that's the tricky thing with that platform particularly. And I think any of this stuff where um, I think it's hard for brands to use humor as a marketing vehicle without doing it consistently. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like no, Bud no, Light's I... a perfect example. Like Bud Light has been making funny commercials for so long that people expect them to make funny commercials and that's why it works. So you kind of have to do that stuff with repetition, I think, in order to really get the most mileage out of it, you know? Right. And the good news was it was, um, you know, it's a new, it's a new market. So they're, you know, totally cold to it. They're meeting yeah. uh, Friction Labs for the first time. And then they just don't, Friction Labs doesn't really have a content presence so much yet. And yeah. then what they have done with content, it's been a little bit all over the place. Some of it's like serious climbing videos with influencers, but they launched the company with a, a video about frictile dysfunction. So they're, they're, they do do comedy. Um, I think it's the, almost like they need to hire you to just make that their content strategy overall. Right. So yeah. And, 
like a cool, funny brand that doesn't take themselves too seriously. Cause you can't, you, it's really tough to mix in then like them with that Alex Hunnell dude, like free client. You know what I mean? It just, it, it can't go from ridiculous where you kill a cat in a video to then like some really straightforward com conversation about like the merits of free climbing and have those things live side by side, you know? Okay. But, but this is, this is going to sound like a crazy question, but I just want to play devil's advocate. Why? Why? Because right. I mean, you have to mean, you have to mean something to your customer base, right? Like you have to, un you have to understand like what your identity is and you have to be able to deliver on that identity every single day. And I think especially when companies are new, you can, you really have to stay disciplined about an approach. You, once you build brand equity with a customer base or a community, then you can start to freestyle a little bit and like push, push into other, whether it's different content types or like I'll use the infatuation as an example. We, we started out and we, we have stayed so disciplined in we are, this is what we do. We do somewhat irreverent, very relatable restaurant reviews and guides and nothing else, right? Like you won't find other kinds of content on our platform or you wouldn't for, you know, five straight years because I still, be, I believe very strongly that like you need to just be repetitious about your approach because you can't, you have to rem remind yourself that people aren't paying attention to everything that you do every day. They're catching like little blips here and there if you're lucky. And so you just have to be constantly repeating your strategy and your brand messaging and over 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 again until it's so clear that like you can survey your audience and they can spit back to you like what your brand proposition is. And then once you sort of have that nailed down, you can start to use that foundation to move into other new things that you want to try. Like we just started doing cocktail content um, partly as a, out of necessity with COVID short, shutting down restaurants. But at the same time, like we felt like now we had the opportunity to try stuff because we've spent so much time building repetitious brand equity in people's minds so that they know exactly what we are, what we do every time somebody asks them, or we ask them or they talk to a friend about it. So I think that's really key, especially in the early days of a business is they need to, and you can help companies do this. They need to figure out what they mean to people and why and then literally just bludgeon people over the head with an approach until like they will, you and they will get sick of doing the same thing over and over again, but the consumer will barely notice if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Well, what's the con? Okay. You, again, I just gave I don't you know a lot if, of information there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if this is a stupid question, but what's the consequence of not doing that? What's the consequence of, you know, people seeing, climbing videos with influencers where they're, you know, talking seriously about using the truck and how it helps them. And then like the video that you just saw or the videos that you just saw. If you, well, I think that it, what ties it all together is the first question, right? I think, yeah, I think like what ties it all together is that, um, you know, they're, they're saying that this is the new norm. Well, here's the, here's the problem is that the campaign is all about it being the new normal, right? Like, shit's weird and we haven't really figured out as things open what the best new normal is or in some places what the new normal is because stuff hasn't opened and so the positioning is like we believe this is we genuinely believe this is the new normal um and the the challenge so here's the challenge for me and let me just um and, and I think this will kind of come through the example in terms of getting your advice. So they reached out to me and they said basically that they want to increase the scope. They're like, what, how, how can we take advantage of it? This is a great product and they're right. Um, how can we build this out and get even more results while we're running this campaign and optimizing this campaign? So then I'm now sitting here like, okay, well, we can do an influencer campaign. We could... Uh, do a contest we could do without thinking creatively we could do um all these different things i could do like a stunt you know um for a pr push and so i'm kind of the the challenge for me is they've established a brand with climbing that that's all over the place because they have this funny aspect they have these influencer videos that are more serious and then they have this need to introduce themselves to people that have never heard of them and it's like my goal, and I know this is all over the place. My goal is to set them up for 
like what is what are the next five years you know where do you want to be in five years and i think that's them as a as a um fitness brand so it's like they they mix chemistry like they science like hardcore science with uh performance athletic products and so, so yeah i got you so there's we gotta back up for a second right because essentially what just hearing you talk about it what the first thing that, that which you just sort of at the end there kind of like laid it out a little bit but like what's the name of the company again friction labs and the, and the, that's the name of the chalk brand it's called friction labs chalk okay so unfortunately and i think they would agree with this it's called ssh okay so the so the brand that a consumer would see on a bottle on a shelf is ssh chalk ssh chalk yep okay what what are the what are the brand tenets of ssh chalk right like that's the first thing that they need to ask, you or they need to sort of answer is all right like what should ssh chalk as a brand what should its values what are its values let me let me try to answer that right now on the spot we believe that like the best scientist paired with performance you know product op like you know performance products will make people better at sports or or safer at sports or will improve uh, the sports experience. I don't know exactly what that language should be, but it's, I think at the foundation is like, these are like chemists, you know, taking existing products or making products uh, better with chemistry. So what if the marketing tells that story? Um, well, I would say none of it. Um, That's a big problem. Yeah, I guess uh, that's a big problem. I guess that's a big, big problem. problem because because think about it this way, right? Like how in the world are consumers supposed to know that if none of the marketing reflects it? But okay, so this is a an, again plain devil's advocate. If somebody sees that commercial, it captures their attention, it tells them about this, you know, chalk that will help them um or, or I guess yeah, is is the the thing I should do now, take a step back and be like, let's tell this brand story to these new audiences that like we're the combination of science and, you that's know. Where it has to, that's where everything has to start. That has to be the core of everything you do. Because the thing is, is like, if I catch one of these videos, if I happen to catch it on YouTube, right? Like I guarantee, like I didn't even remember the branding, right? And I guarantee you the consumers won't either. So the thing is, is like, this is where that repetition thing comes into place, right? Which is that you, your job is actually, like you said, you didn't see good conversion on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. and whether or not people buy this kind of product via YouTube video, who knows? But I will guarantee you that in order for the brand to have success over the long term, they need to see the mark. The consumer needs to see the marketing, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook or on a billboard somewhere, and and very quick like there need there will be like an impression like this is the thing that a lot of marketers make the mistake of thinking like well all the things that i know about the brand that i put into this video are going to come across and the consumer is going to remember all of it the reality of the situation is the consumer will remember none of it it will it will leave an impression of some sort and you have to bludgeon people over the head over and over and over again with the, with that impression so that when they actually which is more likely this scenario when they realize they need some hand shock or they're at a you know whatever, like the, when they're making an intentional purchase, they need to choose that brand, right? And what's going to make them choose that brand? Well, that's where the brand values come into play, right? Like that's what great brands are is they, they, they represent something to an, a consumer that they like, and that's what makes them choose that brand over a competitor or continue to buy the products. So like what I would say is that you can still have humor involved, but if I were in your shoes, I'd probably make my next humorous videos about like, hilarious science shit, you know, in a lab or something, because mm -hmm. you've got to start to tell that story. If that's truly like, I guess the other question you can ask yourself is like, well, let's say somebody makes another liquid chalk. What's going to make the consumer choose SSH over the new Amazon basics brand that they just created? You know, it's, it's the brand, you know, ultimately like we're, yeah. But yeah. it's the, the story, like you've got to be telling them a story as what they need to understand. Go, this, this one's made by scientists and fitness professionals. Whatever that story is, you have to communicate that to them. Otherwise, they won't know. Right. And people aren't going to buy, people aren't, really aren't going to buy a product solely because, because they saw a funny video. They might laugh at the video, but they, it, has to, it has to connect to 
oh, I understand what this funny video is telling me about the brand and why I should like it. You know? Well, well, maybe they won't continue to come back. Is it they won't continue to come back and see what these guys, you know, make uh, in the future? Ugh, I don't know. I just think that, that just think about it just in your own life, right? There, I, I use this example from my days in the music business. That's actually, I think, extremely relevant. We talk about it a lot at my company. There's an old adage that who knows if it's true, like you know, at, from a metric standpoint, accurate or not, but it is true generally that. It takes someone three different times hearing a song before they even realize they've heard the song before. And it takes probably as many as 10 different times hearing the song before you actually like know some of the lyrics or know the name of the artist, right? And so because of that, like think about how many impressions it takes of hearing a song before you realize you like it. And then you realize that you want to like add it to your playlist on Spotify. It used to be the, the the, the, whole, the whole story of this was rooted back in the days when we were trying to get people to go buy CDs in, in Best Buy, right? And it's true that like the only way you connect those dots is constant repetition such that, you know, someone hears it on the radio and then we buy an ad spot with the, the, the song in the ad spot. And then, you know, this is Bruno Mars, you know, uh, just the way you are, buy it now at Best Buy with the song playing behind it. And then maybe they need to see the like end cap at Best Buy with a picture of Bruno Mars and the single art and the CD sitting there. Like the point is that you have to surround people with the brand over and over and over again before they actually register even what the brand name is. Beyond that, have a relationship with the brand such that they want to be, be loyal customers to it. Like all that stuff takes a really long time and it takes a very organized campaign and it takes repetition. So you need to hit people at the point of purchase, online, on social media, like all those things have to be very coordinated so that it makes sense. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, but it has to be uh, the brand message first and not just, hey, we're trying to sell this chalk and it's the new normal. Yeah, because people don't buy, like again, like if I'm someone that needs that chalk, I've probably already bought it or I already know about the company because I'm seeing it on their platforms right like with if you're just catching that out in the wild you might think to yourself oh that was funny but like in order to really decide that you're going to spend money on that product you're going to have to like pull them in deeper somehow right at least for us to have like a sustained sense of brand loyalty and all the things that a, a, a company should spend money with you to help them build out and like like here's another example if i click on that if i click on the shh website from that hilarious video i'm guessing i'm gonna land on a pretty serious website yeah so so is is part of the approach like we need to add some like because because visually i think it's i think it's actually great but in terms of the content and the copy there's no personality in it so if i was to update the tone of voice do you think that's enough I think what you need, I think everyone needs to be aligned on a strategy that's going to be sustained over time, I think is what I'm saying. Okay. And then the strategy of science meets, you know, performance or whatever that second part is, but like the, you know, the, the sports part or sports performance part, do you think that that's an interesting positioning? Well, it has to be somewhere. Like if that's really the brand's value, like if that is the core value of the company and the, and the real value proposition, you have to message that somewhere. That can't just be something that only the executives talk about internally, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, like where would I see that message? Uh, well, you would, see, you would need to see it first and all the- No, I'm know. saying like right now. Like right now, if I click on their website, where would I see that message? Oh, it's nowhere. It's nowhere. Right. Right. Um, so like that's actually the probably the biggest problem you, everyone in this company has right now is if that truly is the value proposition of the product. This is an innovative product made by scientists and fitness professionals. And that's how you know it's amazing and it's going to solve all your problems. You have to message that somewhere, right? Otherwise, how does anybody know? No, I, I, t I totally agree. Um... And so then I think like, I think what, what's happening is I think that, which look again, like I love the approach you took, but I think the, the, the danger here is that you're going to wrap an entire brand strategy up in COVID messaging, COVID relevant messaging, which is like, 
it's good to m make people understand like how this can be beneficial to them in this environment. But, but if you're going to plan to have success anytime outside of COVID, you need to make sure people understand why it's a great product regardless of pandemic or, or not. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think like if I were, if I were sitting on the marketing team at SSH, the first thing I would do is just say like, wait, we need to really do some work here to make sure that people understand like, you know, SSH, what's the sub, what's the sub headline under our brand logo that everybody sees all the time, right? Nike, just do it, right? Like what is, what is that thing that we pound people over the head with that helps them understand why they should buy products from us, you know? Right. Overall, you know, particularly cause I think they're, uh, well, so, so their tagline right now is the new standard in chalk, but that feels limiting. Who is that relevant to people that buy chalk already? Uh, yes. So like it's, it's okay. kind of okay for, you know, climbing people, but if they're now trying to appeal to new audiences, I think it needs to be, you know, bigger and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. If you're making an argument that people need to wear this in the gym because it has the same amount of ethanol that's in, you know, FDA recommended products to kill germs. Like that's not a climbing chalk audience. That's an audience of people that are nervous about going to the gym in this environment. Right. Right. And yeah. so like, that's fine. You can make that argument, but like, if you're going to do that, you need to then help people understand like, why, why should I trust this brand to make a product that can keep me safe in the gym? Right? Like why, like why, even just because you're telling me it's safe, like, do I believe you, you know? And do I think that this is a reputable company? Do I think like it becomes pretty important that scientists engineered all this stuff and not just like, a dude in his basement who had an idea, right? I mean, that's like a pretty key part of your marketing message there is that, hey, this is gonna protect you from, you know, coronavirus germs at the gym, not only because we said so, but because here's how, here's how you can be confident because it's all scientists, you know, uh, formulated. Right, so we should be selling the company first and then the product, you know, maybe as like a next step. You have to do both at the same time. I think, look, you can, here's what I guess what I would say. Like, I think a great next step for you guys with these videos is to do some of that, like, like somehow incorporate the story about it being made by scientists and professionals, you know, fitness professionals and do it in exactly the way that you just did that, which is funny and entertaining. And it'll get that message across in a really meaningful way. But then I would just try to recommend to, to the brand that like, when we do all that, let's just make sure that when they land on the website, that that message is reinforced, like scientist engineered or whatever that, that sort of message is. You want to just continue to sell people on that as they make the journey through the, you know, purchasing and converting from their cart, just so they feel like, great, I get it. This is a company that built this intentionally and they're, it's rooted in like, they'll, if you tell the story, right, they'll understand, right? It's like, oh, this is started as a rock climbing, you know, uh, el an element of, you know, an important element for rock climbers. So it's built from like, you know, uh, it's not like it just came out of nowhere yesterday, right? And it's also engineered by scientists, which is important so I can trust that like, it's not gonna melt my hands off, right? And I like that they're funny and fun and that speaks to me as a person too, because I'm a, you know, I, I'm a fitness enthusiast and an adventurist because like, I don't take my life too seriously or whatever, you know, like that's, I think the stuff that you need to, sort of hit. And, I, and it seems like you can do all that. All, all that I'm suggesting is that, you know, don't think so much in terms of a campaign. Think in terms of like a broader marketing message that needs to get put out into the world and have the campaign be a part of that, but not, you know, it's just hard to build out successful strategy if it's only rooted in like one piece of a campaign. Right. So what if, what if it was, uh, you know, introducing the company or the, you know, the whole new tagline that is about science and, uh, you know, uh, sports products or, or whatever. And then you're, you're doing retargeting, right? So then, then we have like some element of, of this campaign, it, you know, with this guy who's in the gym using this chalk. And then we have, you know, harder hitting, I guess you could call them conversion assets that are just, you know, either there's a promo code or it's just a yeah. still, is Those that all tools in your toolbox? Okay. Got it. I think Got like, it. like, here's what I guess what I was trying to get at. And I probably, you know, belabored it too much, but just to simplify it again, and I'll use an example again, just as like the way we think about brand and, and mar the way we sort of like always think about marketing. So we, you know, we have core brand tenants of the infatuation and they are 
you know, the, the, this is when it comes to like the brand, right? It's, it's relatable, it has levity, it is conversational, and it's credible, right? So truthful and accurate. And we, anytime we're trying to, really anytime we're trying to decide if we're gonna do anything, we always refer back to those things and go, does it tick all those boxes? And if it doesn't, we don't do it. Because it's a way to sort of keep your brand values as your North Star as a company. And it helps you make decisions really easily about like, hey, does this idea, which is a good idea, is it gonna serve our brand or not? And if the answer is no, and if it doesn't sort of hit those, each of those four things, all of, not one of, then we, we don't do it unless, it unless it hits all those four things. So that's a very brand centered marketing approach, right? But I'm just a person who believes very, very, very strongly that brand is the most important piece of marketing. So, Got it. so I think that that's something I would encourage that the SSH or, or their parent company to really think about, which is to say like, okay, beyond the scientist engineered and fitness, you know, and uh, professional approved, like what are some other things that make up like the core tenets of this brand? And that may just be the product itself or if there are going to be other products generally. Right. And, and it seems like hopefully like humor is a piece of that. It should be, if this is a, a strategy that they want to pursue, and if it is, then you can start to build out a plan. It doesn't take much to just refocus things towards that end result, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right? Um, and so I, I, that's how I think I would think about it. And then, yeah, like all the tools you're talking about, retargeting, promo codes, you know, all events someday, like down the road, there's all these things that you can do, but you need to have those sort of core tenets in order to understand even like, let's say that down the road, SSH is going to do an event. Well, like what's, what's that event going to feel like and look like and what's going to happen there. It should all feed back to those brand tenants always. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, then you start to build a world that a consumer can understand and actually identify with. I mean, like every great brand in the world is very, very good at this Think about like Patagonia, right? Like Patagonia has this commu worldwide community of people that will basically buy their shit forever because they understand the brand values of Patagonia. And they say that I have those values as well. And Patagonia doesn't do shit that doesn't fit into those brand values, right? Right. And without even knowing, I mean, I'm wearing my Patagonia hat today. <laughs> uh, without even knowing exactly what Patagonia would say their brand values are, I think I could take a pretty good guess and be correct, right? Sustainability, uh, you know, longevity, right? Everything's guaranteed forever. Um, you know, social responsibility and, you know, um, being like the best, you know, possible gear for outdoor enthusiasts. Like I'm guessing that that's some version of their world of brand values. And I know it because I've been surrounded by the brand for so long. Right. And that's what makes, that's what creates longevity. And that's what creates the ability then for SSH to go out and say like, Hey, we, we're going to make a glove now, or we're going to make, you know, a, a, I don't know what other things are that, rock climbers or gym enthusiasts use. But you can imagine that if you start to say like, we're gonna start with this one product, but down the road, we're gonna evolve. In order to do that, you have, in order to even to sell that product well, you have to help people understand like, why should I buy this and not just the cheaper thing, right? Like, why should I not just be price sensitive? Right, right, right. Um, do you think it would be a good idea for me to share this video with the client? <laughs> and just be like, look, depends on, depends on how, how confident they feel in their plan right now. Um, well, I guess, I guess the, the reason I'm, I'm asking if you think that's a good idea is basically I'm going to be coming to them and saying, Hey, I didn't really know that the right thing to do was to take a step back and like really find what this company is. That's their, honestly, what I'm talking about is something that they need to do. I mean, I think, look, they should have come to you with more of a direct, clear sort of brief about what their in intent is here, right? And I don't know how you guys sort of came to each other and how the deal got worked out. From my perspective, if I'm the marketing person or the brand manager, whoever you're dealing with over at that company, and you did some work for me and then you came back with a really thoughtful approach that said, look, I think we need to do some more work on communicating the brand message so that we're not just out here doing like slapstick videos that are never gonna connect back to something bigger, I would probably give you more money. Or at least I would say, well, let's take a shot at that together because I'm not so, it doesn't seem like someone over there is having that conversation 
or at least it doesn't seem like it's permeating beyond a handful of people internally. So what I would tell you just from what you've told me is it seems like they probably just need some help doing that work of connecting the dots from brand value to campaign. And I don't see any reason why you wouldn't go suggest to them that you can help them do that. Okay. Pretty, pretty rad, man. Pretty also might get you fired, but I don't know. <laughs> I would, I would rather suggest the, the right thing to do and get fired than uh, just keep, keep going along and doing the wrong thing. Well, I think, look, I think in this for, what you're, for what you're trying to do, right. Is I think that you're going to be more successful if you can help people understand that not only are you the guy that people can come to for humor in marketing, but did you understand the fundamentals of marketing and you just help their brand be more successful. Right. And here's how, why humor can be a, a venue for that and a channel for that. But like, it's going to be much more compelling if you're sitting across from me in a meeting pitching me your services, if you can also just speak very clearly about fundamental core marketing principles that, you know, um, will help them have longevity. Right. And I think, you know, being able, if you can go in and sort of speak to some of those case studies, like I think Bud Light's a perfect example, right? Which is like, it doesn't mean that brand, your brand won't be taken seriously, but like everybody's favorite commercial at the Super Bowl always are the Bud Light commercials. They're known for that, right? That that gives them brand separation from the other guys. Like that's that's a great comp to say like, look, that wasn't, you know, they've got to have a plan that's more broad than just the commercials, but it can be a piece of it. But like the commercials also tell a story beyond just being funny, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that's awesome. So what, one thing that we're actually doing uh, right now is trying to market our own company, not outwardly, but understand internally, at least initially, like what, why people should go with a comedy ad agency is saying we're a comedy ad agency right away and that fits what they need. Um, you know, smart or do we need more of a rapper? Uh, so what, one thing that, um, you know, with, with doing this capabilities deck exercise is, is the positioning that I'm putting out there for the company. And let me know what you think about this is like the world is like more cluttered than it's ever been. There's these crazy stats about how much content is being uploaded at every time, but these digital channels are still really important and valuable. It's just like, you have to stand out. And then I say, you know, how, how do you do that? And the answer is be likable. And then the best, you know, quality that universally makes you likable to so many people is a good sense of humor. And that's based on a statistic where it's like 87% of people, you know, buy more from brands that they like uh, or something like that. And then humor leads to likability. These, these are, you know, scientific studies. And then that, you know, that's where gush comes in and then blah, 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 blah. But that's how we're setting it up right now. Do you think that's compelling? Definitely. Yeah. I think, look, anytime you can point to stats, it helps. I think the story you're telling makes a lot of sense. And I think obviously, you know, you, you as a person can, can sell that. Right. I think that's, what's most important is that, you know, that it all fits together, that the story you're telling is believable because you believe it so much that I believe you. you right. Know what I mean? right. 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 Um, but I do think that, kind of this whole thing we're talking about with the chalk stuff is, is relevant for you too, which is that, you know, like I learned this very early on, probably later than I should have, but early enough on at the infatuation as we were building it, that it was able, we were able to sort of like really rally around it and it helps us a lot, but, but building out a mission statement and brand values or core tenets or whatever, we weren't even going to call them. It could be like four bullet points, whatever, but you need a mission statement sentence and you need some brand tenets. And that way, whether it's for you or you, the people you bring on to work with you or clients, it'll always help you have this like North star of like, what are we trying to do and why? And then how are we going to do it? You know? Right. And right. I think, you know, that, I mean, you seem to have a very, like, I love that you have a clear proposition and that's something that a lot of probably other agencies don't necessarily have, or it's a lot more vague and it's sort of like, you know, whatever. So I think just like formalizing that more, yes, those stats help a lot your story makes a lot of sense, right? Like when you first told me what Gush was and why you wanted to do it and all that stuff, like it's a very clear proposition. And I think as you get into capabilities, you just need to hone in on like, you know, here's how we do the things that we do. And, and here's why we think those things work. And anytime you can support with data, that's great. But I do really think that 
I guess I'm just also like a probably, I've, I've, there's a lot of different kinds of marketing people, right? I am at my core brand marketing person. Like I'm the last person you want to have, like build out your conversion strategy or your like retargeting strategy. I just, brand is where my brain sits and that's always where I go when it comes to this stuff. Um, but I do think it's like the most important thing in, in marketing. So when you think about, yeah, you need to put a pitch deck together that has your capabilities and your story, but like, what's the gush brand, you know? Yeah. And what does it represent and how does it look in the world? And like, and, and, and how do you make sure that everything that you do speaks back to that mission statement and those brand tenets and then ultimately what your pitch is to your potential, you know, clients. So what's your tagline? Do you, do you, do you guys have one? What's, what's your, yeah, you, ours is, you spoke about it, but. Yeah. I mean, so ours, you mean like our mission statement? Or are like, what do you mean like our marketing tagline? Well, like, like for instance, like we, we believe that funny makes money and then, you know, that's sort of, that's sort of our platform. Yeah. Ours has been for a long time that we are your restaurant decider, but like now that's changing because restaurants are not necessarily open. So we're actually having a whole discussion about this now internally about like, how do we better reflect what we're doing now, which actually incorporates cocktails and wine and like all these other things, takeout and delivery, right? Like we're actually having a moment right now where we have to rethink a lot of this stuff. Um, our mission statement has been to build the most trustworthy, incredible restaurant discovery company in the world. That still, to some extent, will remain true, but I think we're even gonna have to widen out that restaurant discovery part to something that covers more broad parts of what we do. And that's an interesting thing, right? You, you can reshape and reassess these things as you go. Um, right. But yeah, ours has been, you know, my whole thing from day one, like I said, up to really now has been, everything we do is focused around restaurant decision making. And that's what we do. We don't do like broader food media. We don't do news. We don't, I mean, now, like, and now we're changing a lot of that, but that was the whole thing. And I do think that served us well as we needed to familiarize brand new cities. Like when we launched in LA or we launched in Chicago, when you roll into these places and you have competitors and all the rest, people need to understand like, what do you do? Why should I care? And you have to have very simple answers to those questions. And then you need to beat people over the head with them. That's just like Friction Labs, right? They they start as a chalk and then now, you know, they're at a, a place where they have an opportunity to expand and be bigger things to more people. Um, so in terms of, you know, it's one of the ways that you guys are thinking about it. Here's, here's the insight that I have because you asked me right now what I think of the infatuation, right? And like suggestions that I have. Yeah, I did right now. I just asked. Yeah, you yeah, yeah, totally, totally, totally. Uh, maybe it got cut out. So part for time, but yeah. Yeah. So like food, I, I don't know. There's so many things around, like, I think in general, what you guys are to people where it's, you know, it's an expression of you in terms of how people see you in, in a lot of ways, you know, and I think at the core, like we really care about that in terms of what you decide to make for somebody when they come yeah. over in terms of what restaurant, you know, people want to be in the know. Um, I, I don't know that that to me was always why I came to the infatuation and became a fan of it. It's just like, it has these guides that, you know, it's like best places to go on a date and I can look good to my date, you know? Yeah. We've said for a long time that and we never really said this outwardly cause it's too, just isn't a good marketing message, but it's true. And it's been a, a thing that we talk about internally all the time is that we're not actually giving people restaurant advice. We're giving them social capital. Exactly. Because, exactly. Because if you're the person in your group of friends or at work or on a date or whatever, if you can pick the like perfect place, you look awesome. And that's the thing that really has always been such a big part of our brand. You're right. Is that like when you, when you help someone have a good first date or when you help someone look good to their boss because they picked the right restaurant for that boss's client meeting or when you help someone navigate their way through a brand new city they just moved to, you like imprint on, like, you know, it's like, it's a different relationship than like, I went to this website and I found something. Um, but like, in order to get there, you have to build those brand values that people relate to, right? Like, that's the whole thing is you can't just like snap your fingers and matter to people in that sense. But haven't you guys built that? Like, yeah, like we to have. me, it's, it's just like, if, if you were made the point about, this bringing me social capital. I'm like, fuck yeah, it does. You know, and you say it in a cool way. I don't know. Like, I, I think that, that uh, that's cool. Yeah. I think that, I think there's ways for us to translate it to the consumer face or consumer facing marketing that you don't need to outright say that. Right. I think like, that's why, and look, this is the lesson we've learned is that as 
we've now sort of gone inside of our homes, you know, one of the best things that we learned as a result of this is that people have obviously given us permission to help them make decisions outside the home and to give them social capital as it relates to going to restaurants and things like that. They've also given us permission to may help them make decisions inside the home. And so it's the same thing, right? It's like, if you can pick the great bottle of wine or now like make an insanely good margarita just because we helped you do that, it all fits into the same general principle. Um, and yeah, you're right. Like we'll probably need to reassess some of our internal, like even mission statement stuff to fit in, you know, that element of more broadly giving people social capital around food and wine and travel and lifestyle and things like that. But, you know, there's still a lot we're figuring out as we go. I just, I have a tagline for you, which is a great, so we, we started this section or I guess I started this section of the podcast called son of a pitch. Uh -huh. And it's basically, it's basically, I'm going to pitch you a series of ideas and okay. you're going to evaluate them. Uh, you know, one to 10, 10 is you're hired on the okay. spot. And one is my ears are bleeding. Got cool. It. All right. Uh, so, so there's, I have four ideas for you. Are you ready to go through the ringer? I'm going to just rip through them. Bring it. Okay. Uh, the first is a tagline. Wait, do uh, I give, do I give my numerical rating in real time? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Just as soon as I say that idea. So okay. the first is a tagline that I just came up with for you. It's called look yummy. Uh, that's a zero. That's a zero. Okay. Uh, that's not on the scale. So that, that's, I think that just means that should, that should, that should, uh, that should communicate something. Okay. So my ears are bleeding. I don't have ears anymore. Let's just say that. They're gone. Can I get, can I tell you why? No, I know why. It's a horrible, horrible No, but like we have on. a whole band list of words that yum and any conjugation of yum is on there. I mean, look yummy. Is the dumb. I like, you know, I came up with that on the spot. Just, just joshing. Okay, so this one's called Infatuated. It's you partner with Hinge to unmask the COVID dating scene at the hottest, you know, restaurants that have like reimagined, you know, as date spots. That's a, that's a seven. I like that. Seven. I'm a little concerned about safety, but you know. Eh. Risk it for love. Uh, okay. The hard, harshest critic in the world. And my dog reviews actual restaurants. He's harsh, but fair. And, you know, just does little tastings, little tiny portions. That's it. You're hired. Ten. Anything dog related, I'm in. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. You heard it here. I'm going to hold him to it. Okay, this one's called, this is the last one. It's called Catering to COVID, okay? And isn't a good comprehensive guide. There it really isn't a good comprehensive guide in all the COVID restaurants, but I had this dining experience at this place called Bodega Wine Bar really close to me where they built this entire patio and it's just immaculate. It's better than the restaurant ever was. And I know that there's a lot of people there doing creative things to you know, stay in business. And so having like a content series where somebody goes around and reviews those, but also, you know, uh, bundling it up with like a COVID restaurant review series. Um, so written and video reviews catering to COVID, what do you think? Uh, in, in concept, I give it an eight. I think in practice, what we found is that with these restaurants right now, as long as you're giving them a 10 every time you re review them, great. But the problem is, is like, we've said, we've been talking a lot about this. I don't know if you saw, but we, we took the ratings off of our website. We don't have ratings on the infatuation anymore. We took them all off. And the reason is, is because number one, those ratings are not accurate anymore because all these restaurants that have now reinvented themselves are totally different than what we reviewed and scored. But also, I cannot imagine a world in which we send a staff writer from our company into a restaurant who are like these places are desperately surviving, barely surviving and, and then be like 7.3. Like you can't, you just can't do it. You cannot yeah. do it because it's not cool. So I think it's great. And it's that we're doing some version of that. Like we are trying our best to showcase, look what these restaurants are doing. Like we did a thing in LA. Um, our, our staff writer Brant wrote this really great sort of like almost like an essay about what it was like to go back to Dantana's, which for people who don't know Dantana's is a legendary Hollywood um, Italian restaurant that's been around since the 40s, I think. And, you know, famous because every, you know, it's like every, every celebrity in Hollywood has been in and out of there at some point. It's great. Like it just has a great vibe and the staff is awesome. And, and so Brant from our staff went in and like ate at Dantana's like outside in their weird little outside setup now. And, and it was, you know, he really had a good time, but it was like he took a picture of the staff and they all have the face shields on. Oh, and, yeah. You know, it's just such a really interesting sort of showcase of what's going on out there right now. And 
And it felt good because we, we weren't there to give them like a rating or a score, but we were just sort of there to say, here's what's going on at Dantana's. We had a great time. It's different for sure, but it didn't feel weird and you should go do that too. So yeah, what you're getting at is, is a good idea and, and we're doing some of it in some way, shape or form. Um, but I think we're just trying to be really conscious of the fact that like, oh yeah, tough right now. And then honestly, a lot of these, I mean, in LA, it's a little bit different because the weather is pretty consistent year round, but um, you know, in a place like New York, there's a lot of this going on as well, where there's really cool, like, you know, city blocks are shut down and all the restaurants are in the street and that's amazing. But come October, that's not happening anymore. So. Right. Hopefully we find a vaccine. Well, you know how like Airbnb just celebrates like the coolest places yeah. around the world. I think it was just like a celebration of like dope shit. Yeah, you know? totally. No, I think you're right on. I think that's, that's been a big part of change for us too, is just saying, you know, what we were always known for, I think, and the reason that people trusted us so much is we were willing to say like, don't go here. It's not worth your money. And, or, Hey, like here's a better place. You know what we would just be honest about that stuff. It's a different time and they're different times call for different needs. And I think even consumers, right? Like I don't think a consumer is really interested in reading a negative restaurant review right now. What they do want is to, to your point, celebrate the places they love, even if it's aspirationally. I mean, I've seen a lot of travel companies that are doing travel content. That's just like, Hey, remember this place? Someday we'll go back. It's awesome. But like celebrate it, you know? So it's a, it's a good idea for sure. Okay. That's right. I just have two more questions. You got yeah, yeah uh, they're long ones. So do you have like 20 to 30 minutes? Uh, whatever. That, that's, a, that's a, that's a joke. That's a joke. Okay, it's going to be, it's, it's you, a are good pretty, joke. you are pretty, um, thorough. So I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Well, um, it sounds like a compliment to me. Um, okay. So speaking of compliments, I actually want you to critique because, so this is a formal, you know, form formal kind of setup of a mentor mentee relationship through ad week. And so as someone who's mentored a, a lot of people and advised a lot of people, um, how would you, what critique would you have for me as a mentee? Um, that's a good question. I think, look, you're so early on that it's tough. I think I'd have a better ability to really give you like constructive feedback if you were a little further along, but I know what stage you're in, which is just like, you're doing everything yourself. And this is what we spend so much time talking about, right? You're doing everything yourself. You're really digging in and trying to like find, you know, you're doing new business and you're trying to optimize your ops and all the rest. So like, look, I think what I, it's not necessarily a critique, but what I would say I think is the most important for you right now is just like resilience because it's such a hot, this is the hardest time, right? Like this part is really the hardest part. You're like, I need help, but I don't have, you know, the, the resources to hire a bunch of people. I'm like, it's sort of a chicken and the egg scenario. And so some of it's just going to come down to like uh, stamina, you know, um, and that's a really tough thing, you know, it's, it's, um, but it's also kind of what separates the people from the successful ones and the ones that don't make it because a lot mm -hmm. of people just don't make it through the really, 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 really hard times. And I think that's, if I've learned anything, if there's any consistent thread through the entrepreneurs that I know that are successful, it's that like, I mean, they all have faced like unbelievably dark times and very intense challenges, but the ones that are successful, the ones that just fought through it, all of them. Right. So I think, like that's a, not so much a critique, but I think it's just a bit of advice, which is to say that like, especially as we're all sort of dealing with the current environment of COVID, like you just got to stay in it and keep going because if you do, it will, it'll work out. I believe that. Right. And I think like that really is to me the, the sort of easiest indication of success for their likelihood of success is like, will these people figure it out because they refuse to not figure it out, you know? Yeah. Do you have an example for you of, of, a, you know, a dark time for the infatuation? I just find those so I mean, inspiring. Totally. I mean, when we first, when we first set out to go full time, um, and we were like, you know, essentially we were a blog in New York city that two guys ran and we reviewed restaurants and we decided like, okay, we're going to leave our jobs, which we both had, you know, Andrew, my business partner and I had amazing jobs and like great careers inside of the music biz. Like we had fun, awesome, good paying jobs, right? Jobs like my job at Atlantic records was my dream job. And it was something that I had set out to get since I was in college. And I spent 12 years at that company and I left and we did it because we really believed in what we were building. 
And then we went out to raise money and like, it took us a year to raise our first round of capital because all people would say to us was, we don't need any more, who needs more restaurant reviews? And like, this is just a blog. And over and over and over again, I mean, I remember getting, we probably left our jobs in April and by the summer, the end of the summer, like we barely raised any money. And I remember just thinking like, oh my God, what did we do? This is not going to work. We're never going to raise the money. We're never going to get to a place in which we can hire people or, you know, it just like felt yeah. like, like we were, I mean, it was very similar to the stage year. And I think like, I mean, we were staying up like all night, like barely sleeping. My wife and I talk about it all the time, like that was such a weird and tough time because I was probably getting three hours of sleep a night because we were trying to, we had just launched a San Francisco site and we were trying to build out all these other parts of the business. We couldn't afford to hire anybody. And literally I saw my old boss who she's the chairwoman of Atlantic records and a good friend of mine. We had dinner, like it was probably in October or something like that. And we'd finally ultimately raised the money because like the way that it works is like you start to get one or you knock down one or two like good news moments and like have a couple investors say yes. And then it just starts to happen, you know, but I saw her right probably as we were getting some momentum around the round and everything else. And we sat down for dinner and she looked at me and she's like, we're going to eat like one thing and then you're going home. She's like, she was just like, you look like shit. Was, oh my God. And I was like, yeah, I do. And then it was funny because we raised the money and I must have seen her and her husband at like a Christmas party or something, you know, a few months later. And her husband, who I hadn't seen in a while, who I love too, like came up to me and he's like, wow, you look way better than Julie said you looked. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm getting sleep now. But it was one of those things where like, you know, for the first you know, six, eight months of us trying to, trying to just set off on our own and like get that first hire under our belt and do all that stuff. There was no, we were nowhere near confidence that it was going to work out, but we just, honestly, even our lawyer, I mean, I remember just like everybody just being like, no, no, you, you guys will probably figure it out, but like, who knows? And we just had to fight, you know, we just had to like dig in and do it. And I don't know, man, I, it's, it's not, I, you know, it's sort of cliche to sort of, to talk about that you know, that idea of grit and all that, like you hear these stories over and over and over again. And it doesn't mean like, there's no guarantee that it's going to work out, but it increases your likelihood of success exponentially because this, this is, these are the moments when a lot of people d tap out, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm close to tapping out, which is good. Yeah. Um, I didn't say that because that's the impression I got for you. I just know what it's like to be the sort oh, of totally. one show and everything is your problem and you're desperately, my wife is, she's raising for a, a company right now and, you know, she's sort of evolving something from a nonprofit model to a for-profit model. And, you know, she, for so long, she just gets so frustrated by the idea that she's like, I got everything is on me. And like, it, you do have moments and days where you're so tired from that, but you just got to stick it out, you know? There's still like a, you know, funness um, to it. Absolutely. But one of the ways I like to end and, and you gave this resilience advice that is totally a common thread. You know, that's absolutely the most important takeaway from, this is probably my 10th or 11th podcast episode. I would say, you know, 90%, which is nine out of 10, I don't know, have said resilience. And it's, but, you know, it's totally yeah, true. It's so cool. it, um, but is there one little nugget of advice, you know, that with, without any restrictions, you know, life advice, Gush advice, ad advice, advice, advice that you would give me? Yeah. Um, this is something that's also fairly common that I see. And I think it's like a, one of the most common sort of pitfalls that people fall into is um, don't build something that's, a, that's about you, right? Like if you're the most important, if you are the critical element of your, your company or your brand, your plan, and like it can't function without you, you'll fail because you aren't scalable, right? So you have to build something that you can train other people to do. You know, you have, you cannot, it cannot rely on Tim being the secret sauce that makes this whole thing work. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. you've got to figure that. I mean, that was true for us, right? I was like, okay, like Andrew and I wrote a thousand restaurant reviews over five years in New York city. Like that was the brand voice and it was the two of us, but like, we were never, ever, ever going to be successful if we couldn't figure out how to make other people do that too. 
And that was our biggest sort of first hurdle to clear was like, can we train people into the voice? Can we hire people that can do what we did for so long and make it about the brand and not the people? Um, right. right. And I think that's, that's, that's true for, it's true for scalability. It's true for longevity, but it's also true for your sanity, right? Because you cannot be required to make every decision, do every job, and or sprinkle your secret sauce on like everything that you do. You need to create something that can operate without your day-to-day, minute-by-minute oversight. But I think a lot of people, there is a commonality amongst entrepreneurs, which is that almost all of us are ego-driven maniacs on some level, because why on earth would you have the confidence to do this shit without any credentials via which to do so, right? Like that's what most of us are doing, right? As you're doing yeah. something that like you just believe that you could do because you have that in you, that also can lead to a situation in which you believe that you are only, you are the only person that can do these things. And I, I mean, we've all, you'll deal with this at some point where some point if you're successful, you'll, you'll hand something, you'll start handing stuff off that you've done all the time. I did that with writing. Like I built the brand, brand voice. I edited every piece of content in the early days. Like, and then I, at some point had to stop writing. And it was actually good advice I got from another founder of another company who was like, if you're the CEO and founder of this company and you're still writing the restaurant reviews, you're failing. I was like, you know what? That's a very, very, very good point. So mm-hmm. keep that in mind as you build is that like you need to, it's not going to happen yet, but you are going to need to make sure that you don't build something that relies entirely on you to succeed. Great advice, Chris. I can't thank you enough. Let's definitely keep in touch. For sure, man. Uh, this has been invaluable. For you. you got some good stuff going on. And I think it's just a matter of, like I said, just keep at it. So always happy to uh, chat and help wherever I can. You're the fucking man. I love you. Thanks, man. All right. Talk out there. Talk Until next you. time. See you later.